You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 214 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Uh, Sorry we missed last week. I was on call and had to work, but we're back with this show and we'll pick up right where we left off with the Battle of Perryville in Kentucky on October 8th, 1862. When we left off last time, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, and the Confederates had moved into position to attack the Federal left, northwest of Perryville. Braxton Bragg planned for the rebel attack to be made in echelon, that is, in stair-step fashion, from north to south, so that the pressure on the Union defenses would gradually increase as each Confederate unit joined the assault until the Yankee line was broken. Benjamin Cheatham's division on the north end of the rebel line would kick off the Confederate attack. Cheatham commanded three brigades, led by Brigadier Generals George Manny, Alexander Stewart, and Daniel Donaldson. Every regiment in the division was from Tennessee, except for the rookie 41st Georgia. Cheatham believed his entire division stood beyond the Federal left, so he decided to strike and roll up the end of the enemy line with Donaldson's men and use his other two brigades as a reserve to exploit Donaldson's expected success. At 2 p.m., all was ready, and Donaldson gave the order for his men to start their attack and begin the Confederate assault. After the struggle that morning for Bottom Hill and Peters Hill, an uneasy quiet had settled over the battlefield but now the fighting was about to begin again in earnest. Over the next five hours, the intense combat would push both Federals and Confederates to their limit. While the Confederates moved into position for their attack, On the Federal side, Colonel John Starkweather's brigade arrived at the Dixville Crossroads at about 1.30. As you guys will recall, Starkweather's 28th Brigade had become separated from the rest of Rousseau's division, and so had ended up at the tail end of the column as McCook's 1st Corps moved up toward the front. Starkweather parked the Corps' supply wagons at the Dixville Crossroads and tried to figure out his next move. None of McCook's or Rousseau's staff officers were there with instructions or to guide him into position, so Starkweather made a key decision on his own. As he wrote later, quote, Thinking the extreme left to be most accessible and from appearances one that should be held at all hazards, I placed my command at once. In other words, Starkweather, on his own initiative, decided to move up and use his brigade to shore up the left end of the Union line, which just happened to be the exact spot about to be attacked by Donaldson's Confederates. As Starkweather moved up, Harris's and Little's brigades of Rousseau's division were already deployed on Loomis Heights, a mile to the east of the Dixville Crossroads, supported by George Webster's brigade from Jackson's division. The rest of Jackson's division was positioned around the open knob to the left of Rousseau's line. After moving his men up to the front, Starkweather deployed the 24th Illinois in the fields south of the Benton Road, where they formed a link with Harris's brigade. The 79th Pennsylvania took position in a wood line to the left of the 24th, with its left flank resting on the roadway. 
The 1st Wisconsin and the brigade's two artillery batteries were posted on a piece of high ground north of the road, soon to be known forever after as Starkweather Hill. The 21st Wisconsin was held in reserve behind the hill. In front of Starkweather Hill sprawled a large cornfield, and beyond that was the open knob. Lovell Rousseau appeared just as Starkweather finished his deployment, and Rousseau gave his stamp of approval to his subordinate's initiative, later saying that, quote, Colonel Starkweather had the good sense to fall in on our left, and I found his brigade on the very spot where it was most needed. Rousseau, however, did make one significant change to the brigade's dispositions when he ordered the 21st Wisconsin forward from its reserve position and into the cornfield in front of Starkweather Hill. As the 21st Wisconsin moved into its new position, less than a mile away on the Confederate side of the lines, Donaldson rode over to his lead regiments, the 15th and 16th Tennessee. The 16th commander, Colonel John Savage, was an old U.S. Army veteran and a notoriously prickly officer. He had previously clashed with both Cheatham and Donaldson and had been on report for insubordination. As Daniel Donaldson and Savage stood at a wood line and surveyed the terrain to their front, Donaldson pointed out the only Federal battery visible. The enemy cannon, posted near the Dixville crossroads, belonged to Captain Samuel Harris's battery of Webster's Brigade. Donaldson said that the Yankee battery would be Savage's objective, but the testy old officer protested so strongly that Donaldson had to repeat his order to attack three times. Finally, at 2 p.m., an extremely agitated Savage led his men forward in a frontal attack toward Webster's Federals. The 16th and 15th Tennessee formed up and moved west with the 38th Tennessee in support. Advancing with their left, aligned on a small creek, the Tennesseans disappeared into a small dip and then climbed into a bowl formed by a wooded ridge to the north, an open ridge to the south, and a ridge with the widow Gibson's cabin to the west. At first the rebel attack went well, but as the men moved up out of the bowl, they began to realize they were in a terrible trap. Ahead of them stood the 3,000 rookie Federals and six cannon of Webster's Brigade. To the Tennesseans' left, that is to the south, were Harris's veteran Yankees, while on the rebels' northern flank was the veteran 24th Illinois of Starkweather's Brigade, which had just moved into position south of the Benton Road. Added to that, the Confederates for the first time detected the presence of the Federals of Jackson's 10th Division on the open knob. The Union troops all gave the attacking rebels a rude welcome with the storm of bullets and shells. One eyewitness later recalled how, quote, As the 16th Tennessee approached the lowest point in this depression, the enemy opened a murderous fire upon them with musketry and artillery from right, left, and center. The ranks of the 16th Regiment were mowed down at a fearful rate, and the 15th Regiment also suffered severely. The ranks closed up, and the brigade pressed onward in the charge. Despite the enemy fire pouring in from three sides, the Tennesseans kept moving forward. They pushed to within 150 yards yards of Webster's position before being pinned down by the concentrated Union fire. As the battle swirled around her home, the widow Gibson grabbed her three sons, ages ten, eight, and five, and hid below the cabin's floorboards for the rest of the day. Meanwhile, Rousseau shifted several of Harris's and Starkweather's regiments to help blunt the rebel assault, and by 2.30 most of Donaldson's battered and bloody Tennesseans had fallen all the way back to their jump-off positions. The failure of Donaldson's attack threw a wrench into Cheatham's plan, since it showed that the end of the enemy line on the Federal left was not where the Confederates had thought it to be. And so now, instead of using Manny's and Stewart's brigades to exploit Donaldson's success, Cheatham was forced to redeploy them to make a frontal attack against the northern part of the Union line. Manny's Tennessee and Georgia troops would lead this assault, with Stewart's men providing support. Cheatham's new target was the open knob, which was topped by eight cannon and a makeshift Union battery commanded by Lieutenant Charles Parsons. 
3,000 Federal Infantry of Terrell's Brigade were posted atop the hill and along its sides. This battle was Terrell's first time to command infantry in combat, and most of his men were seeing action for the first time. Fortunately, Terrell's division commander, James Jackson, was atop the hill and directing the fighting from astride his horse. At the base of the open knob stood a rail fence. Beyond that fence, about 300 yards of rolling open ground rose to a wooded ridge where Manny's Confederates had formed up for their attack on the Federal position. George Manny could see large numbers of Union troops defending open knob, so he decided to advance with artillery support. Lieutenant William Turner's Mississippi battery of four guns deployed on Manny's right and started to shell the Yankees across the way. Meanwhile, Manny's infantry emerged from the woods and started forward. The Confederates swept ahead with the 41st Georgia on the right and the 6th and 9th Tennessee to the left. The 1st and 27th Tennessee remained in reserve. With every step forward that Manny's rebels took, the Federal fire increased in intensity, especially when Terrell fed the 123rd Illinois into the fight. Finally, Manny's attack stalled out at the fence. According to Colonel George Porter of the 6th Tennessee, quote, at which time it seemed impossible for humanity to go farther, such was the havoc and destruction that had taken place in our ranks. The Confederates took shelter behind the dubious cover of the fence's wooden rails, as they were unable to go forward and stubbornly unwilling to go back. As the rebels hunkered down and traded shots with the Federal defenders, the battle for open knobs settled down into a stalemate. The Confederate advance had come to a standstill, but the ensuing firefight had a profound impact on the course of the battle. As the two sides pounded away with shot and shell, Federal 10th Division Commander James Jackson turned to one of his aides and said, I'll be damned if this is not getting rather particular. Then he was shot in the chest, knocking him out of the saddle. A captain rushed to Jackson's side and later described the scene, saying, quote, I found him on his back, struggling to speak, but unable to do so. He died in a few moments. End quote. This was a crucial blow to the Union troops defending Open Knob, since with Jackson's death, they had lost their most experienced infantry officer. Terrell now found himself in command of the Open Knob, and the responsibility seemed to overwhelm him, since he neglected the infantry fight and fell back on his roots as an artillery officer and focused his attention on directing the fire of the Federal cannon on the hilltop. Occasionally, he would come to his senses and send an infantry regiment down the hill to try and drive the nearby Confederates away, but the rookie Yankees always fell back in the face of the rebel fire. On the Confederate side, sound leadership held the situation together. When Manny saw his brigade's assault stall, he went forward to steady his men. As shells and bullets flew by, he walked back and forth along the line, inspiring his men by word and by deed. On Manny's orders, the 1st Tennessee came up and began moving around the Yankees' northern flank. Manny was preparing to lead a charge at the Union Cannon on the open knob when the Green 105th Ohio started down the slope toward the Rebels. Private Josiah Eyre described what happened to the 105th, quote, By some reason or another, we could not form into a proper line, and after going through several maneuvers in order to do so, we became mixed and confused, not knowing what our officers were saying. Finally, we were ordered to load and fire as best we could, although I could not see a rebel at the time on account of the shape of the ground. I, with some of our other men, marched forward ahead of the regiment so that we could get sight of them. I repeated this two or three times before we were ordered to fall back. By this time, every man seemed to be looking out for himself as we were all broken up. For my part, I could not tell whether we had any regiment or not. In a matter of minutes, Manny's Confederates had shattered the Ohioans with volleys of musketry from the fence line. The 105th Ohio was the last unit that Terrell would throw away on ill-advised sorties down the front slope of Open Knob. As the 105th broke and fell back up the hill, Manny ordered his men up and over the fence. 
One of the colonel's staff officers later said, quote, Every man was instantly on his feet, and I don't suppose that 1,200 men ever made such a yell before. The charging Confederates rushed up the hill and swarmed over Lieutenant Parsons' cannon in brutal close-quarters fighting. But Terrell and Parsons had to be physically dragged away from the guns to avoid being captured. But seven of the eight cannon were overrun by the onrushing rebels. By 3.30, Manny's Confederates had captured Open Knob, a significant achievement. But more work remained to be done, because now, just ahead, waited John Starkweather's brigade of Federals. As Manny's Confederates swarmed over the top of Open Knob, the 12 Federal guns on Starkweather Hill opened up on them, making that spot an unhealthy place for the rebels. Stewart's Reserve Brigade now came up on Manny's left, and with the added momentum provided by those reinforcements, Manny's troops pushed down the Open Knob's back slope toward the cornfield where the 21st Wisconsin was positioned. The 21st Wisconsin was a green regiment. In fact, it was so new it hadn't yet received its colors and had only drilled together three times. It already had a feisty reputation, though, thanks to the incident with the slave catchers at Bloomfield a few days earlier. Colonel Sweet was ill the day of the Battle of Perryville, so the regiment would go into its first fight under Major Friedrich Schumacher, who was a veteran of the Prussian Army. Unfortunately, the men of the 21st Wisconsin could hardly see beyond the spot they stood on because of the eight-foot-high corn stalks blocking their view in every direction. Retreating Federal soldiers, fleeing from the collapse of their position on Open Knob, had pushed through the 21st line, causing a bit of chaos, and Major Schumacher told his nervous men, quote, to keep cool and not fire too high when the order was given. Manny's Confederates advanced toward the Wisconsinites' front, while Stewart's troops approached their right flank. The rebel battle flags waved above the corn. As one soldier from the 21st remembered later, quote, someone gave the order and we up and let fly, end quote. The 21st let loose with two point-blank volleys that ripped through the corn stalks and de- dropped dozens of the nearby Confederates. The 41st Georgia and 5th Tennessee both lost their commanders to wounds, while the 9th Tennessee lost every company commander. But those two volleys were all the Wisconsinites could manage before the Confederates crashed into them. Hand-to-hand combat broke out as both sides grappled for possession of the cornfield. Major Schumacher went down with two wounds and lay dying. Captain George Bentley of the 21st Company H emptied his revolver into the oncoming rebels, killed one enemy with his sword, then went down after shooting another rebel with a captured pistol. One of the Federal soldiers later described how the bullets flew, quote, as thick as rain. Colonel Sweet came from his ambulance to take command of his regiment, but he was almost immediately wounded and put out of action. For a few moments, the soldiers of the 21st Wisconsin braved a brutal baptism of fire, but then the regiment broke and men fled for the safety of the Federal artillery on Starkweather Hill. Manny's and Stewart's Confederates followed in hot pursuit. By a quarter to four, most of Cheatham's division was bearing down on the 1,500 Federals in Starkweather's three remaining regiments. Donaldson's men had returned to the attack and were pressing the 24th Illinois on Starkweather's right. The 24th, a predominantly German unit from Chicago, fought hard but was pushed back into a position bent at right angles to the 79th Pennsylvania. But the efforts of the Illinoisans and Pennsylvanians, when combined with those of parts of Webster's brigade, brought Donaldson's Tennesseans to a halt again. Meanwhile, on Starkweather Hill, Manny's and Stewart's Confederates charged up the slope as Colonel Starkweather turned to his men and shouted, Now, my brave First Wisconsin, do your duty. Sergeant Elias Hoover recalled how the, quote, Rebels came in a solid column to take the battery, and we were ordered to rise and fire. The old First would not waver, and the fight was hand-to-hand over those cannon. The 1st Wisconsin successfully defended the guns from this first Confederate attempt to overrun Starkweather Hill, and the rebels fell back to regroup. 
Manny's and Stewart's men reformed and attacked again up the front of Starkweather Hill. However, the second rebel charge was stopped by the fire of the Federal cannon and the 1st Wisconsin in front and the 79th Pennsylvania on the flank. Colonel Starkweather was in the thickest of the fighting, inspiring his men to turn back the enemy assault. The frustrated Confederates were again forced to withdraw to the foot of the hill. It was now about a quarter after four, and a short lull settled over the action. Both sides took the opportunity to survey the situation. The Union defense of Starkweather Hill had stood firm against Confederate frontal attacks, so Manny decided to use the 1st Tennessee to flank the Federals. That regiment's colonel had the same idea and was getting into position. Starkweather observed this enemy movement from atop the hill and realized that he might not be able to hold back a third Confederate charge. To make matters worse, as Starkweather looked south, he saw Rousseau's Federal troops giving way. That meant if Starkweather's men stayed where they were, the brigade might be cut off and destroyed. Starkweather realized the situation was critical and that it was probably time to fall back. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time. And the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What Starkweather saw as he looked south was Hardy's Confederates attacking the Federal positions overlooking Doctor's Creek and the Bottom House. You see, while Cheatham's rebel troops engaged Terrell's and Starkweather's Federals to the north, other Confederate units down the line were swinging into action as part of the Echelon attack. The second part of Bragg's Echelon attack got underway about 3 p.m., while Manny's rebels were stalled along the fence in front of Open Knob. South of Cheatham were two brigades from Patton Anderson's division under Colonel Thomas Jones of Mississippi and Brigadier General John C. Brown of Tennessee. Brown was an experienced officer with a good brigade, while Jones was filling in for Anderson and had never commanded a force larger than a regiment before this battle. Jones' three inexperienced Mississippi regiments were deployed south of Donaldson's position, with Brown's Florida and Mississippi units to their left. Significantly, Patton Anderson never visited this part of the front, since he preferred to remain with other elements of his division on the Springfield Pike. Anderson also failed to designate a single commander in this sector, so the two rebel brigades here would operate more or less independently of each other. Leonard Harris's brigade of Federals from Rousseau's division stood opposite Jones and Brown. Except for the rookie 94th Ohio, the rest of Harris's Ohio, Indiana, and Wisconsin troops were all veterans. 
Harrison's, Harris's men had been in position for several hours and were prepared to defend their part of the Union line. They were supported by Captain Peter Simonson's six-gun Indiana battery. The terrain in front of Harris's position was some of the most complex on the battlefield. Three north-south ridges paralleled the Union line of battle. Harris's men occupied the westernmost one, which was open, while the tree-lined eastern ridge was held by the Confederates. Between the two forces, the narrow center ridge reached just high enough to create the optical illusion that the enemy was only on the next crest over. About three o'clock, Jones's three Mississippi regiments advanced out of the woods. Most of his men carried smoothbore muskets, except the men of the Company K of the 27th Mississippi, who were armed with infield rifles, so they preceded the advancing line as skirmishers. It was this company's commander, Captain John Sale, who first perceived that something was amiss with this attack. Due to the optical illusion, the Confederates had thought the Federals were on the next ridge over, but Captain Sale was the first to discover that there was a middle, empty crest, and the Yankees were actually on the next ridge over, just to the west. Sale halted his men and reported his discovery back to the brigade. He was told to move forward, so he led Company K over the middle ridge. Meanwhile, Colonel Jones abandoned the brigade and found a safe hiding spot for himself. As the Mississippians suddenly topped the middle rise and burst into full view of the waiting Federals, Harris's men were impressed by the determination of the Confederate attack. One Ohio so- soldier later said, quote, With closed column and the rebel yell, which we then heard for the first time, they came on like veterans and the onslaught was terrible. The Mississippians repeatedly tried to continue on over the middle crest, despite the heavy fire pouring forth from the Union infantry and artillery. But the enemy fire proved too much, and the Confederates couldn't advance farther. After twenty minutes it was all over, and the dazed survivors of Jones' brigade retreated to the safety of the rebel lines. Half of the 34th Mississippi lay dead or wounded on the field. Only one officer of that regiment escaped the fight unhurt. The casualty rates for the other two regiments also approached 50%. Leaderless, battered, and bloodied, Jones' rookies were out of the fight and useless for the rest of the day. As Jones' Mississippians broke down in front of Harris's Federals, Brown ordered his three regiments forward about 3.30. His brigade had sheltered in the valley of Doctor's Creek, and at Brown's command, they started forward toward the Union position. The men raced forward so enthusiastically that the regiments got out of alignment, and the 3rd Florida's Lieutenant John Inglis remembered how Brown used some colorful language to get the units to dress or straighten their lines. The general warned, quote, Dress up, or you will be cut to pieces in short order. The pause while the three regiments the 1st and 3rd Florida, and 41st Mississippi, dressed their lines, was fortunate since it gave Brown the opportunity to take a moment and survey the situation. Seeing the shattered remnants of Jones' brigade fleeing to the rear, Brown realized a headlong charge by his brigade might suffer the same fate. He also understood that if his attack failed, the Confederate center would be left wide open for a possible Federal counterattack that could drive a wedge between Cheatham's troops to the north and Simon Bolivar Buckner's division to the south. Brown, therefore, needed to guard the rebel center and hold the line together. Seeing that his men had corrected their alignment, Brown renewed his advance, but rather than trying to push beyond the middle crest like Jones's Mississippians, Brown ordered a halt. Spreading his brigade out along the ridge, Brown's regiments began trading fire with Harris's Federals across the way. Brown's excellent command decision delivered his brigade to precisely the right spot at just the right time to do the most good. For the next 45 minutes, both sides lay prone and blazed away at each other as best they could. But the firefight here couldn't continue indefinitely, and by 4 p.m., both sides were running low on ammunition. The need for more cartridges became especially urgent on the Federal side. 
Harris's Yankees searched the wounded and dead for ammunition, while Brown's Confederates received a resupply that enabled them to keep up their rate of fire. On the Federal side, companies and then regiments ran out of bullets, and officers ordered the men to fix bayonets and stay down as best they could as rebel fire continued to pour in. It was a supreme test of discipline for Harris's men to lie on the open ridge, taking fire with no way to reply. But they did it, and the situation in the, in the center settled into a bloody stalemate. With the stalemate in the center, the last chance for the Confederates to achieve a breakthrough in Pierce McCook's first corps line was the southernmost part of the Echelon attack, composed of Simon Bolivar Buckner's Strong Division and Brigadier General Daniel Adams' Louisiana Brigade of Anderson's Division. Their mission was to attack west along the Mackville Road, smash the Union troops at the Bottom House, and push one mile west to the Dixville Crossroads. The Mackville Road was defended by Colonel William Little's Brigade of Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio regiments, supported by Captain Cyrus Loomis's Six-Gun Battery A of the 1st Michigan Light Artillery. To reach the Federal line here, the Confederates needed to advance 500 yards down a long slope in full view of the enemy, cross Doctor's Creek around the bottom house, and finally climb 100 yards up Loomis Heights to Little's position. Buckner decided to attack up the road in column of brigades. Bushrod Johnson's brigade took the lead, followed by Patrick Claiborne's veteran outfit. Sam Wood's troops would shift to support Brown's men, who were holding down the rebel center, and St. John Little's brigade brought up the rear. About 3.30, as Cheatham's men captured Open Knob and Brown started his brigade forward in the center, Bushrod Johnson ordered his men to move out. Almost immediately, the Confederate advance got out of hand. At the last minute, the axis of advance had been changed, but only part of Johnson's command had received the order, with the result that different regiments slalomed across the battlefield according to how they understood they were to advance. Meanwhile, the Federal artillery rained shot and shell down on the Confederates. As Bushrod Johnson and Simon Bolivar Buckner worked to straighten out the confused rebel advance, Artillery fire suddenly smashed into the Confederates from their left rear. The 44th and 25th Tennessee promptly wheeled left and charged the guns. However, it turned out to be a case of friendly fire, as the Washington Artillery of New Orleans had been shelling Little's Federals when the rebel infantry got in the way. The 44th Tennessee's colonel, John Fulton, later said, quote, We charged rapidly up the hill with fixed bayonets to silence and take the battery on our left, and having gained the top of the hill, we found it to be the Washington artillery, and immediately reported to them that they had been playing upon their own men. End quote. So, you know, uh, oops. Finally, Bushrod Johnson's Tennesseans got themselves sorted out and continued their advance toward Doctor's Creek and the Bottom House beyond. This section of the creek featured a deep valley with very steep banks, which in some places were a nearly vertical 40 feet high. Little had given permission to the 42nd Indiana to fill their canteens before the battle, and the men were still down in the creek bed when the fighting started. Their muskets were stacked up on the bank, and when Johnson's advance rolled forward, the 42nd was in no position to mount a defense. Many of the Yankees were shot down while trying to climb out of the creek, and some two dozen were captured. The rest fled for the safety of the Union line. The Confederates swept across the creek and into the teeth of Little's defenses. North of the Mackville Road stood Loomis's cannon and the 10th Ohio, while the 3rd Ohio and 15th Kentucky overlooked the bottom house south of the road. All three Union regiments were veterans, while the green 88th Indiana stood back in reserve. The 3rd Ohio's colonel, John Beatty, described the rebel approach. Quote, They advanced under cover of a house on the side hill, reached a point 150 yards distant, deployed behind a stone fence. In this position, the 3rd rose and delivered its first volley. For a time, I do not know how long thereafter, 
It seemed as if all hell had broken loose. The air was filled with hissing balls. Shells were exploding continuously, and the noise of the guns was deafening. The Federal's fire was later described by the 37th Tennessee's commander as, quote, an almost overwhelming storm of lead, end quote. The 10th Ohio added its fire into the mix, and Johnson's rebels became pinned down along the stone wall near the bottom house. About a quarter to four, Buckner's next brigade, Patrick Claiborne's, moved up in support of Bushrod Johnson's beleaguered command. Claiborne's men had fought at the Battle of Richmond with Kirby Smith, and now a lot of them were carrying captured Union equipment, and a good many were sporting blue uniform pants. At any rate, Claiborne's men hustled forward under fire to Doctor's Creek, where he detached the 13th-15th Arkansas Consolidated Infantry to support Johnson's troops at the Stone Wall. The Arkansans arrived on the scene none too soon, since the Tennesseans were running out of ammunition and had to withdraw. Claiborne was unwilling to give up the stone wall, so he moved his whole brigade up as Johnson's men pulled back. Atop the hill, Beatty's 3rd Ohio also ran short of ammo and was relieved by the 15th Kentucky. The 517 men of the Kentucky Regiment stood atop the hill and gamely traded fire with the thousands of Confederates at the stone wall down below. Nine color bearers were shot down, and the 15th Lieutenant Colonel and the Major were both killed. The regiment's Colonel, Curran Hope, was wounded but remained in command. The unit's adjutant recalled how Pope continued, quote, moving from man to man, patting them on the back, cheering and encouraging them to fight to the end. Such courage could not but inspire them with determination to stand to the last. H.P. Bottom's large barn stood nearby, and shell fire set it ablaze, killing many wounded of both sides who had crawled there seeking shelter. The 15th Kentucky held firm until they too ran low on ammunition and traded places with the 3rd Ohio, whose men had refilled their cartridge boxes. It was now about 4 p.m., and Simon Bolivar Buckner cast about for a way to break the deadlock at the bottom house. He found Daniel Adams' brigade of Louisianans from Patton Anderson's division nearby and realized they were in a perfect position to sweep around the Federal flank and smash the enemy line. Buckner explained his plan to Adams, and Adams got his men moving. Making good use of cover and terrain to mask his advance, Adams deployed his 1,900 men at right angles to the 3rd Ohio and 15th Kentucky. About a quarter after four, Adams ordered his Louisianans to attack. The attack of Adams' Louisianans put the 3rd Ohio and 15th Kentucky in a difficult spot. The 15th Colonel Pope turned part of his regiment to face the oncoming rebels, while the remainder continued the duel with Claiborne's Confederates. Beatty shifted the 3rd Ohio to face south and ordered his men to fix bayonets and charge in a desperate effort to check the Louisianans' assault. But the 3rd Ohio had barely started moving before events overtook the two federal regiments. That's because at the Stone Wall, Claiborne was preparing an attack of his own. Adams' advance was the signal for Claiborne's men to head over the wall and hit Little's Federals from the front. Claiborne's attack was successful due to his use of some innovative tactics. He later said, quote, I now advanced in line of battle, my skirmishers ten paces in front of the line, carrying the battle flags of the regiments. As we ascended the hill, we were fired on by our artillery in the rear. I sent an aide to stop this battery. I can only account for this blunder from the fact that most of our men had on blue federal pants. We again advanced. The moment our flags, carried by the line of skirmishers, appeared above the crest of the hill, the enemy, supposing our line of battle was in view, emptied their guns at the line of skirmishers. Before they could reload, our true line of battle was upon them. They instantly broke and fled, exposed to a deadly fire. Under pressure from the front and right, Little's entire brigade gave way. Little tried to impose some order on the retreat, but fell with a serious head wound. He was captured by the Confederates. 
Little's collapse unhinged Harris's position to the north and forced him to fall back under pressure from Brown's and Sam Wood's Confederates. The Federals here in the center withdrew in good order, though. As Harris led his men back, he kept an eye out for a good place to make a stand. By 4.30 that afternoon, McCook's entire First Corps line was breaking apart under Confederate pressure. On the left, Starkweather prepared to abandon Starkweather Hill. In the center, Harris's men were pulling back. And on the right, Little's men sought to escape from the Confederate onslaught. Meanwhile, on the Confederate side, Polk and Hardy, although initially opposed to Bragg's attack plan, now urged their troops on to greater exertions, hoping to turn the Federal retreat into a rout. With the Confederate objective, the Dixville Crossroads, within reach, the battle teetered on a knife edge. McCook's corps was now fighting for its very survival. His men needed some time and space to rally and recover from the Confederate attacks. And at this critical moment, several Federal commanders stepped into the breach and acted to save First Corps from destruction. But that part of the story will have to wait until next time. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Manny's Confederate Brigade at the Battle of Perryville by Stuart W. Sanders. This episode uh, could have been twice as long as it ended up being, but in the interest of keeping the story moving along, we have to draw the line somewhere as far as how much detail to include. But if you're interested in learning more about the Confederate attack on the federal left, then you can pick up Sanders' book, Manny's Confederate Brigade at the Battle of Perryville, which includes a lot of great first-person accounts from the fighting in this sector. Don't forget you can find a list of all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Here at the end of the episode, we want to be sure to give a shout out to the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade, Janice, Chris, and Michael. And also thanks to Robert S. for his donation to the, bo- to the podcast this past week. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you'll join us again next time as we wrap up our discussion of the Battle of Perryville. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.